Turn with me, please, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 2, the second chapter of Leviticus. In Hebrew, we call it, Ve'yikra, Ve'yikra, and Yahweh called, or, and God called. Leviticus, the second chapter, we're looking at the grain offerings. Now, when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and shall take from it his handful of its fine flowers and of its oil with its fragrance, a uh, frankincense. And the priest shall offer it up in smoke as its memorial portion on the altar, an offering by fire of soothing aroma to the Lord. And the remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord by fire. Now when you bring an offering of a grain offering baked in an oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers spread with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering made on the griddle, it shall be a fine flour unleavened since the oil um, mixed with oil. You shall break it into bits and pour oil on it it is a grain offering. Now if your offering is a grain offering made in a skillet, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. When you bring in the grain offering which is made of these things to the Lord, it shall be presented to the priest and he shall bring it to the altar. The priest shall then take from the grain offering its memorial portion and shall offer it up in smoke on the altar as an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, Again, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord by fire. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. You shall not offer <coughs> any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you shall bring them to the Lord, but they shall not ascend for a soothing aroma on the altar. Every grain offering, moreover, you shall season with salt so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all of your offerings you shall offer salt. And you shall bring your grain offering of early ripened things to the Lord. You shall bring fresh heads of grain roasted in the fire, grits of new growth for the grain offering of your early ripened things. You shall then put oil on it and lay incense on it. It is a grain offering. And the priest shall offer up in smoke its memorial portion, a portion of its grits, with its oil and its incense as an offering by fire to the Lord. The grain offering. What does this have to do with us? Jesus fulfilled the law. He is the fulfillment of the sacrificial Levitical system. Why should Christians study such things? It means nothing to most believers. In fact, when we understand that the epistle to the Hebrews is an inspired commentary on the book of Leviticus, it should mean everything to believers. Look with me very briefly, please, to see why we study such things. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 10, being uh, designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek. Concerning him we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. Everyone who partakes of milk only is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He's a baby. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. He wants to explain to them the Old Testament typology of Melchizedek. How Melchizedek is a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of Christ. What it means, but he says, that's meat. I can only give you milk. Once upon a time, there was a uh, paramedic, pretty good paramedic got to like emergency medicine as a paramedic, saving people's lives on highway crashes and things of that nature, resuscitating people with coronaries, getting them to the hospital 
in time for the physicians to save their life. Nothing wrong with being a paramedic. It's honorable. It can help people. It can even save people's lives. But this particular paramedic took a real interest in emergency medicine and decided to go back to university and to medical school. They wanted to be a physician. They wanted to go deeper. So when they got to university, they found out that they have to learn protein synthesis. They have to learn how proteins are made from polypeptides, and how polypeptides are made from peptides, and how peptides are made from amino acids. They had to begin with biochemistry, and then go to physiology. I didn't have to know all this stuff to be a paramedic. No. You only learned how to tourniquet somebody who was hemorrhaging. Now we have to show you how a protein called prothrombinase causes blood to clot. I didn't have to know that when I was a paramedic, but now you want to be a physician. One day there was a policeman walking the beat. And he decided, you know, I kind of like this law enforcement. I should have went to law school. So he does. Goes to law school, and they begin teaching him Malum and say, ipso facto. I didn't have to learn Latin to be a cop. <laughs> Corpus delecti. There's the milk and there's the meat. Being an electrician is a good job. Good union, good trade. But if you want to be an electrical engineer, you have to learn those equations. No shortcuts! Only in the church we have people been saved 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and more. And they've only had baby food. Nothing wrong with baby food. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Teach it to the little kids in the Sunday school. Praise God. But a baby crawls around on the rug looking for solid food, and his mother vacuums everything and puts anything up where that kid can't reach it because if it fits in that kid's mouth, that kid's going to eat it. Their senses are not trained to discern the edible from the inedible. When Christians are only given a diet of baby food, they'll believe every wind of doctrine as the apostles put it. They don't know any better. They'll believe all kinds of rubbish. Kingdom now theology, the false unity of ecumenism, purpose-driven lies. They'll believe anything because they don't know any better because they've only eaten baby food. Paul bemoans this in Corinth. I gave you milk, not meat. The author of the Hebrews bemoans it. I'm giving you milk. You should be teachers by now, but I'm giving you milk. I can't tell you about Melchizedek, about Old Testament typology. That's meat. No, you can teach a paramedic how to tourniquet a hemorrhaging artery and get them to a hospital before they bleed to death. You can do that. But to teach how blood coagulates, <laughs> you have to teach protein synthesis. You have to teach about prothrombin and how prothrombin is made by prothrombinase. You have to teach the meats. It's the same thing as any other field or discipline. Same principle. The Lord wants us to learn. But they just get milk and milk and milk. And the way things have become in the last 15 to 20 years, milk would be an improvement. They remind me some churches of the Hindus sipping the cow urine. I'm not joking, they do that. So we begin with the grain offerings. Some Christians have an idea, I guess many Christians have an idea, that the Old Testament Levitical sacrifices of animals like the Paschal lamb or the Se'er Azazel, the scapegoats at Yom Kippur, they're pictures of Christ in some way, these animals. They may know that. I guess some Christians kind of know that. 
But most people never would have thought of the grain offering. We're told in John chapter 6, and we're even told in the Mishnah, that matzah, which is striped and pierced, unleavened bread, corresponds to the flesh of the Paschal lamb. By his stripes we are healed. He was pierced for our transgression. With the grain offering, and grain in turn relates to Jesus. He is the word. Grain is the word. This is my body, the word. The word was made flesh. The logos became socks. So we go with Leviticus chapter 2. The grain offering was offered in three different ways. It was offered on an open grill, open flame, in a skillet, and what we call in Hebrew, betoka tenor, inside an oven. Why was it offered three ways? We are tripartite beings. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Animals are only bipartite. They have a body and they have a soul. We are three. There are two things, primarily, that the Word of God uses to teach us about the triunity of the Godhead. Two. We are imagio dei beings made in his image and likeness. We have a body because God does. Prepare thou a body for me. Whenever you see God appearing in human form, it's always the Son, always Jesus, even in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord, Hamal Akadonai, who wrestled with it, Jacob, uh, the, the Peniel, the book of Jabbok, that's Jesus. When Adam heard God walking in the garden, that was Jesus. Well, it wasn't called Jesus yet, but it was, we have a body because God does. Prepare thou a body for me. The Holy Spirit or the Father never appear in human form. But then we have a spirit because God does. The Holy Spirit searches the depths of God. We have a mind, as it were, a soul, because God does. Who has known the mind of the Father? The reason we are three in one is because God is three in one. So you're tired, and you know you should pray, but you don't feel like it, or you have had a long day, and you've got to get up early, and all of a sudden there's that guy you've been trying to witness to and share your faith with, open to hear the gospel, and you want to go to sleep. Your spirit wants to tell him about your testimony, but your flesh wants to go to sleep. I want to know. Is there one of you, or are there three of you? There are three of us. They each have their own will, yet they're one of us. There's one of us, and there's three of us. Why? You can draw a distinction between your body. I know people in their 70s and 80s that are vivacious in temperament. I know people that are old women by the time they're 15, you know, <laughs> old men by the time they're 18. Then. <laughs> you can be one way in your mind, another way in your body, and another way in your spirit. Every one of us, there's three of us, each have their own will, each have their own personality. There are some very nice people who are not too attractive. There are some very attractive people who are not very nice. There's three of us, and there's one of us, there's one, and there's why. Because that's how God is. He makes us in his image and likeness to teach about himself. It's not relevant to our teaching today, but the other is marital procreation. The Hebrew confession of faith, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is oneness, not one, oneness. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The rabbis changed the meaning of Yahid and Achad. Rambam changed it to point Jews away from believing in the Trinity. But here was where the Lord of God is oneness. Adonai Elohim, Adonai Achad. Okay. But then Adam and Eve were told to become Achad. One, not one, oneness. What happens in marital procreation? One person goes inside of another. The Hebrew idiom for procreating, for consummating a marriage. Nick Nasba, like in Ruth, Nick Nasba. He went into her and the Lord allowed her to conceive. One person goes inside of another and a third is procreated. It's one in three, it's three in one. That teaches about 
the Trinity. You understand? It teaches about the nature of the Godhead. Well, so does the body, mind, and spirit. So the grain is offered three ways. Jesus suffers in body, he suffers in soul, and in spirit. When he was hung on the cross and tortured to death by the Romans, it was cruel. I recall the first time the torment shroud was investigated in the 1970s. I read a, a serious academic book about the torment shroud when it was first investigated in the 70s. And part of the research was they crucified cadavers in France, corpses that were kept metabolizing on artificial life support, Roman style. Of course, the nails would have went through the radius, not through the metacarpal, but it was one of the cruelest. You'd be hard-pressed to fathom a crueler way to kill somebody. They had to pull up to cause diaphragmatic expansion. They couldn't respirate. It was suffocation. Pericardial effusion, edema, all kinds of stuff. It was absolutely excruciating what would have happened to Jesus. We cannot minimize his physical suffering in any way. However, the scripture speaks of the travail of his soul. Travail of his soul. That's in the skillet. The high priest would have the skillet on the end of a long pole like this when the grain was offered in the skillet. Everybody could see the grain being offered on the grill. They could see his physical torture. Everybody could see it hanging on a Roman cross nearly naked. Everybody could see what was happening to him. No mystery of the grain being burned up on the grill. But when somebody's being tortured mentally, emotionally, if somebody is undergoing demonic oppression or bereavement or rejection, other people can understand part of what is happening, but only at a distance from the end of the pole. Only he who looks down from above sees the whole thing. When somebody is being afflicted in their soul, undergoing emotional, psychological torment. Only God understands what you're going through completely. You understand? Only he who sees from above. Other people can only see some of it. <laughs> but then there is batol katanor in the oven. When Jesus died on the cross, something happened within the triunity of the Godhead. Be very careful. Satan has raised up some wicked, wicked liars. They follow the false teachings of somebody called William Branham and E.W. Kenyon. Among these wicked liars, this is truly satanic stuff. Joyce Meyer, first edition of her first book. If you don't believe Jesus went to hell, you can't go to heaven. Kenneth, the late Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland. Satan got the victory on the cross, they teach. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not finished. Even though he said it is finished, Father, into your hands I give my spirit. No, Satan got the victory on the cross. Jesus descended into hell and became one nature with Satan, and he was tortured three days and three nights in hell, and then Jesus had to be born again in hell. This is what these people teach. So because the cross of Jesus is not central to their view of the gospel, neither is the cross of Jesus their view of the Christian life. Instead of pick up your cross and follow me, it becomes blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. You're a king's kid. You don't have to suffer all of this. No, no, no. Father, into your hands I give my spirit. It is finished. He was separated from the Father on the cross. Something, he died spiritually, as it were, on the cross. What happened in that oven? We don't know, but it was this. the eternal oneness of the Godhead was severed. When the Father took our sin and put it on his Son in order to put his righteousness on us, the just for the unjust, the eternal oneness of God was temporarily interrupted. You understand? Why does God hate divorce? Because the permanency of a Christian marriage is supposed to testify to and reflect the eternal oneness of God himself. You understand? What makes abortion so evil other than the obvious murder? <laughs> it interrupts a reflection, a recapitulation of the eternal oneness of the Godhead himself in figure. You understand? Nobody wants to be reminded of their most painful memory. Nobody wants to be reminded of their most painful memory because God doesn't want to be reminded of his. 
God's most painful memory is when his son took our sin and he cursed his own son instead of us. He doesn't like to be reminded how the oneness he had with his son was severed because of sin. He hates divorce. He hates abortion. There's more to that stuff than destroying families and killing babies, even though that stuff's bad enough itself. <laughs> There's much more to it than that. Eternal oneness. Something happened when the grain was offered in the oven. He gave up the ghost. The Holy Spirit went out from him. The eternal oneness of the Godhead was interrupted because of our sin at that one particular time. Everybody understand? Hence the grain was offered in the fire, in the skillet, and in the oven. It had oil and it had incense. Oil, shaman, anointing. Before Jesus was anointed for dominion or power, he was anointed for burial. So was a Christian. Before the Lord can bless us or use us, he has to get rid of the old nature. <laughs> he doesn't just get rid of the sin. The way he gets rid of the sin is he gets rid of the sinner. He gets rid of our good points as well as our bad points. He crucifies us. It all goes to the cross. Then he raises it up. The money preachers tell you differently. Claim God for that victory. Hallelujah. The Lord wants to bless you. Amen. Claim it by faith in the name of Jesus. No, every believer will be anointed for burial. You'll go through a period in your life and discipleship as a Christian where the Lord will deal with our old nature before he can really begin to use the new nature. But then there's the incense. We're told in Revelation and in Ezekiel 13, Revelation 8, the incense, the prayer of the saints. What was the incense offered when the grain was sacrificed? Father, forgive them. In the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom is anointed for burial, anointed to die for the bride. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 6, he goes to the mountain of myrrh, anointed for burial, to the hill of frankincense. He would make that one prayer his father could not refuse. There's only one reason I am not going to hell. There's only one reason you will not go to hell. Because the right sacrifice by the right high priest who had the right incense. The one prayer God could not refuse. The one prayer God himself could not say no to. Father, forgive them. That is why I am not going to hell. That is why you will not go to hell if you truly believe in Jesus. The incense. Turn with me, please, to the song of, to the book of Exodus, chapter 30. In Hebrew, Shemot. The book of names, literally in Hebrew. Verse 30 of Exodus 30, please. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister as priests to me. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. Holy means set apart. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy and shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, or whoever puts any of it on a layman, shall be cut off from his people. The anointing is holy. It is set apart by God unto you. The Hebrew term is mekudesh. Mekudesh. And the word kodesh, holy, pay attention. Before the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he had to undergo an elaborate ritual called Mekudesh, being set apart. Mekudesh is the same term, however, for marriage. In a Jewish wedding, you stand under a hoopah from the Song of Solomon. His banner over me is love. 
and you say to your bride, Ani mekudeshet lach im tabat zu kidat Moshe ve'Israel. With this ring I wed thee according to the laws of Moses and Israel. God has set this man apart to this woman, this woman apart to this man. You understand? Only when the high priest was Mekudesh could he niknas. It was an abomination for anybody but the high priest to go on back of that veil. You understand? Any Jew could read the Torah and know what was in back of the veil. They could know the holy ark was there and the showbread, and so forth. They could know what was in back of the veil, but they were not to know experientially what it was like. There's to know and to know. Greek, gnosko, to know experientially. Hebrew, ladat, to know. You can know objectively, but to know subjectively is something else. Only the one who's mekudesh was to know what it was like to go on back of that curtain once a year on the Day of Atonement. It was a mystery to everybody else. You could know what was back there, but you're not to know what it was like to go in there. Holy matrimony, the same thing, to know a woman. You can get a copy of Gray's textbook of clinical anatomy and look at micro slides of fallopian tissue all day long. You can look at scans of ovum all day long if you want to. Anybody could know what's in there. But only the person who is Mekudesh set apart by God to Niknas. Only the person set apart by God was to know what it was like to go in there. You understand? It was to be a mystery. Only the person set apart was to know experientially. This is like the sin. Adam and Eve were put in the garden to subdue it. They were to objectively know there was sin, but they were not to know sin. <laughs> they were to know what it was, but they were not to know what it was like to do it. This to know and to know. Only the one who is Mekudesh is to know what it's like. Well, the anointing is Mekudesh. It's set apart by God unto you. It's not transferable. Do you see that? You see these silly, ignorant, naive people getting on airplanes, going to a counterfeit revival in Pensacola, or Toronto to get some false prophet to lay hands on them to give them the anointing. This is garbage. Now Paul does speak of the laying on of hands in Timothy and things like that, but it's not transference. It's holy unto you. When Elisha asked for Elijah's mantle, Elijah said, I can't give that to you. See if it falls from the chariot. It's holy. Only God can give it. It's not ours to give to another. Anybody, anybody who makes any like it to put it on somebody else, on a layman, shall be cut off from his people. It's an abomination. It's an abomination to sleep with a man who's not your husband or to sleep with a woman who's not your wife because it's mekudesh. Whenever you see somebody other than the high priest on Yom Kippur entering the Holy of Holies, it's a figure of the Antichrist. You understand? The Antichrist is going to do that. You see, there are people in history and in scriptures who entered the Holy of Holies, but it's usually a picture of the Antichrist. It's an abomination. It's got to be the one who's made Kodesh. An anointing is set apart by God. It's not transferable. But then the incense. The Lord said to Moses, take for yourself spices, stock tay, onikal, Galbanum, spices with pure frankincense. Real worship. There should be an equal portion of each. Notice the worship had to be balanced. <laughs> and with it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfume, were salted, pure, and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine, put a portion of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting, where I shall meet with you. It shall not simply be holy, but most holy unto you. The incense which you shall make, you shall not make in the same proportion for yourselves. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Whoever shall make any like it to use as perfume shall be cut off from his people. Don't use the incense as perfume to make yourself have a sweet, impressionable 
fragrance. It's most holy. Not far from here, there's a church where the worship leaders are entertainers. You know how many contemporary Christian artists in Nashville, Tennessee are failed pop stars? They couldn't make it in the secular music business. Now they're using their lack of talent for the Lord. <laughs> they're perfuming themselves. It's entertainment. It's Hillsong. It's a show. It's garbage. It's a performance. Do not make it for yourself. Not only that, but the proportions are dictated. The proportions are by God's formula. Be careful of unscriptural worship. Just one example. Our faith is Christocentric, not pneumocentric. The Holy Spirit is God, but he's only ever addressed in prayer in the context of the Trinity. Not one time, not one place is the Holy Spirit ever prayed to in Scripture. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son through the Spirit. You see all this stuff? Good morning, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. None of that is scriptural. It is unbiblical worship. It is strange fire. An alien spirit will get in and counterfeit it. It is not true worship. That's why you got that stupid garbage in Pensacola and Toronto and Lakeland, all this garbage. It's all a spiritual counterfeit. The oil is holy. The anointing is holy. The incense is most holy when you put it on the grain. These are serious issues. You don't make it for yourself. Oh, isn't Jacob Prash a good, eloquent preacher? God's not too impressed with Jacob Prash, believe me. He just uses people like Jacob Prash because... He wants the glory instead of giving to the glory to a loser like me. <laughs> That's why God uses people like me. So he'll get the glory. I know I'm nothing. When I was 16, I was fooling around with heroin. By the time I got to college, I was strung out on cocaine. Who am I? Not that nobody. Anything you see has got to be Jesus. <laughs> sure not me. That's for sure. Watch out for people who want to perfume themselves. <laughs> so we go back to the grain. Incense, yes. Oil, yes. No honey. And no leaven. Let's begin with the leaven. Why could there be no leaven in the matzah? Leaven, chametz in Hebrew, contributes nothing to the nutritional value of bread. It only puffs it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. Verse 6, your boasting's not good. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For the Messiah, our Passover, the Mashiach, our Pesach, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. To begin with, it puffs up. Leaven is a figure of sin, but specifically of the seminal sin, pride. According to Isaiah 14, Satan's first sin in eternity was pride. He wanted to be God. Man's first sin was pride. You see a person with a problem with greed, under that greed is pride. You see a person with a problem with lust, under that lust is you see, a person with a problem with unrighteous anger, under that unrighteous anger is pride. Pride is the seminal sin that gives rise to other sin. Get rid of the leaven, but Jesus also said, beware of the leaven 
of the Pharisees. False doctrine. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. When you see people perpetuating false doctrine, propagating doctrinal error, you're dealing with spiritual pride. There was no leaven in the matzah. Jesus had no false doctrine. Nothing puffed him up, and he was God. None of us, not a single one of us, none of us, have anything to be proud of except Jesus. Paul says, you have nothing you haven't received. You're educated, you receive that. You're physically attractive, you receive that. You have good health, you receive that. You're affluent, you receive that. But Jesus was God. We have nothing to be proud of, nothing. We all have a great deal to be ashamed of, every one of us. But nothing to be proud of except what he did and who he is. We have nothing to be proud of except Jesus. Yet he who was God, who became a man to take our sin and to give us eternal life, he had no pride. He had no leaven. The rest of us are shoveling it out every day. That's just the way it is. This goes back to the Bedichat Hametz, the purging of leaven at Passover time. I'll explain it some other time, perhaps. It's what Paul's drawing on. First Corinthians is the most paschal of the epistles. But anyway, there was no leaven in the matzah. Jesus had no pride, no false doctrine. Neither, however, could there be honey. No honey. Like Israel, one day we too will enter a land of milk and honey. All the knowledge, the doctrine will be simple, and everything will be sweet. But right now, it's not like that. Turn with me, please, to the book of Proverbs. Chapter 25, verse 16, have you found honey? Eat only what you need, lest you have it in excess and vomit it. Honey speaks of the things for which we have a natural human affection, human affection, emotion. Eat what you need. People need affection. Eat what you need. Verse 27. It's not good to eat too much, honey. Nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. Eat what you need. Even girls hate mushy poetry. The two kinds of parents who damage their children the most, ones who are overly strict or who are overly permissive, ones who give too much honey, ones who do not give enough. The scriptures speak considerably more, considerably more about a father's love than a mother's love to children. Yet there are fathers, I even know there's, there's Christian fathers who've never hugged their children. That's sad. That's sad. You want to mess a kid up spiritually and emotionally. Too much honey or too little. Oh, don't smack little Henry. Henry's a good boy. Until the police come to the door at 2.30 in the morning and he's not so little anymore and he's not so good, you got to get him a lawyer. You should have straightened the kid out when he was seven. Watch out for too much honey. If you have it in excess, you'll vomit it, it says. This is a major problem among my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals, and I use those terms sparingly. Where feelings are substituted for spirituality. Where the functions of the soul, the emotion, are confused with the function of the spirit. Oh, I just feel in my heart. 
What happens when what you feel in your heart contradicts the word of God? The heart is deceitful above all things. They go by feelings. Experiential theology governed by feelings. This is what the New Testament calls sensuality. It's a pseudo-spirituality. But look what it says about people who do this. Don't need too much honey, nor is it glory to search out your own glory. When you see people doing that, what's really driving them is spiritual pride. They're seeking their own glory. Look how religious I am. <laughs> Forget about Jung, it's garbage. Forget about Freud, it's garbage. Forget about Maslow, it's garbage. You want to understand human behavior? Read biblical psychology. Read Proverbs. Proverbs understands we're three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. It understands the spiritual component to human behavior. Secular psychology just reduces us to apes with better DNA. It makes us two-dimensional. No, we're three-dimensional. Separate subject, I mentioned it in passing. Not too much honey! When Jesus went to the cross, there was no honey on the matzah. We got the honey. For God so loved the world. When that grain offering was offered on the altar, the altar is an Old Testament picture of the cross where the sacrifice for sin was made. When the matzah was sacrificed on the altar, when Jesus went to the cross, there was no honey. Actually, there was, but I got the honey. Jesus got the nails. The wrath and anger of a holy God for what I did, for what you did, was poured out on his own son in our place. There was no honey on that matzah. No honey. Well, you see, when we look at the meat instead of the milk, it helps us understand the Gospels quite differently, doesn't it? But let's continue looking. We then read about the first fruit in Leviticus chapter 2. Look at it. Verse 10, the remainder belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy. I don't take any royalties from our books or tapes or anything like that. I don't charge fees for speaking. I don't charge honorariums, none of that stuff. I do secular business things on the side and things like this. We try to put as much of our money as a ministry into missions and evangelism as we can. But it is a privilege for those who are in full-time ministry to be paid for the ministry. The only people our ministry salaries are our missionaries in Thailand and Israel and Africa. And we take care of rubbish dump kids in the Philippines, AIDS babies in Africa and stuff like that. Okay, those people are salaried. Most of the rest of us are volunteers or something. If somebody is salaried for the ministry, that money that the church is giving to salary somebody for full-time ministry is most holy. Not just holy, but most holy. You have to understand the, old, the way the Old Testament calibrates holiness. The outer court, holy. The holy place, more holy. Most holy? It's like giving that money to the Lord himself. That's his representative. It's those who work hard at preaching and teaching the word of God. Who Paul says are worthy of double honor, honor honorarium, money in Greek. You have to go to work, an office, a factory, a hospital. Why, in addition to paying your own taxes, supporting your own family, should you pay some hype artist to stand up and give people a line of psycho babble every Sunday? Scriptures say, study to show yourself approved. If somebody does not study the Word of God, work at it as a full time, it's not easy. If somebody does not work at it, they don't deserve to be paid for doing it. Study to show yourself approved. God does not approve of them. If God does not approve of them, 
we should not approve of them either. I watch these clowns, I put them off after 30 seconds, I can't stand them. The televangelists, one is worse than the other. One ignoramus after another, they don't know anything, most of them. Every week it's the same thing. Stand in line. I'm just going to share what's on my heart. I'm just going to share what's on my heart. What he really means is, I don't have anything in my brain. <laughs> and he's picking up a paycheck. Go get a job, you worthless bum. That's most holy. Most holy. It's people who work hard at it who should be paid for the ministry. It's not easy. People in full-time ministry, their marriages are attacked more there. I couldn't tell you. But then it continues. No leaven, no honey in verse 11, verse 12. As an offering of first fruits, you shall bring them to the Lord, but they shall not ascend for a soothing aroma on the altar. You can bring them to the Lord, but not sacrifice them on the altar. Why? The first fruits. Yom Rishon of Hagmatzot, the first day of Passover week, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Known to Christians as Easter, but it wasn't Easter. Jesus did not die on Easter, uh, raised on Easter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians all confirm he did not die on Good Friday, nor did he raise from the dead on Easter Sunday. That came from the Quadridecimian schism after the Council of Nicaea, etc. Jesus died on Ed of Hag, Pesach, and he rose Yom Rishon of Hag Matzot, the first day of the week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, very quickly, please. But now Christ, the Messiah, has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. He's the prototype of the resurrection. Remember, the resurrection has already begun. He's the first fruit of it. We are already living our eternal life. We're waiting for our role in the resurrection. The rapture is the same. It began with the ascension of Jesus. The rapture has already begun. We are waiting for our role in it. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 1, it is the last days already. These things began with Jesus, his rapture, his resurrection. Separate subject, I again mention it only in passing, but look at this, the first fruit. When it was still dark on the first day of the week, that Sunday, the high priest would go into the Kidron Valley. If you come with us to Israel next April, I'll take you to the place and show you. When it was still dark, he waited for the first stalk of grain coming out of the Kidron, and he would ceremonially harvest it, calling it the first fruit. The very hour, so he saw the first pin of light coming up and back of Harzayatim, the Mount of Olives, he'd harvest it. The very hour of the very day when the high priest was bringing the first fruit into the temple, the Messiah was the first fruit raising from the dead. As Isaiah said, arise and shine, for your light is come. The glory of the risen Lord is brighter than the sun. First fruit, he dies once and raises from the dead. He does not die again. Therefore, you could not put the grain of the first fruit back on the altar. You understand? Look very briefly with me to Hebrews chapter 7. This is important. We have anybody here who used to be a Roman Catholic? Hebrews chapter 7, please. Verse 27, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then the sins of the people. This he did once and for all. He dies once. The doctrine of the Mass says, no, he continues to die again and again and again, sacramentally. Let's continue. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when the Messiah appeared as high priest, okay, uh, 
verse 12, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all. Hebrews 10, uh, Hebrews 9, 28. So the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. Hebrews chapter 10. Every high priest stands daily ministering, offering the same sacrifices that can never take away sin. On the other hand, verse 14, for by one offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being saved. If something is perfect, by definition, you can't improve it. Hebrews says repeatedly, he dies once, dies once, dies once. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he dies once. The Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass is a fundamental rejection of the biblical gospel. You understand? The Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass is a fundamental rejection of the scriptural gospel, that he died once and for all. They say he must die sacramentally. He dies once. That grain offering can be brought before the Lord at first fruits, but not sacrificed again. Finally, in conclusion, we read one more thing about the grain offering in the book of Leviticus, chapter 2. We read that there is a distinction, and that distinction is between the grits and the whole grain. Look at it. Verse 14 if you bring a grain offering of early ripened things, you shall bring fresh heads of grain, roasted on the fire, grits of new growth for the grain offering. You'll put oil on it and lay incense on it. It's a grain offering. And the priest shall offer up in smoke its memorial portion with its grits. However, we also read the following. Verse 13, every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering when you offer it. You shall bring grain offering of early ripened things to the Lord, fresh heads of roasted grain, grits of new growth. Okay. It comes in two ways. First of all, it has to have salt. Even modern food science, things like sodium benzoate, Food preservatives are all salt-based. Salt was the only preservative they had in the ancient Near East. Salt. The Word of God preserves. It'll preserve a Christian's faith. It'll preserve a family. It'll preserve a marriage. It'll preserve a church. It'll preserve a movement. It'll preserve a society. It'll preserve a nation, a civilization. But you get rid of the salt, what did Jesus say? When the salt loses its taste, it's good for nothing. Whole grain and crushed grain. What is the difference with these grits? Crushed grain is what you've eaten this morning. It's when somebody with the gift of teaching operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, hopefully, crushes the grain and feeds it to you. Here's what it means. Expository preaching. I'm going to crush the grain and give it to you. Most people would not be able to understand these things. Some people would. Most would not. Somebody has to crush the grain. Here's what it means. Some people have the gift of teaching. Some have the gift of evangelism, etc. Oh, here's the crushed grain. However, there's the whole grain. If you go out there to that book table, you'll find books, DVDs, CDs. Crushed grain out there. That's good, but it's not good enough. No amount of crushed grain should substitute the whole grain. The prayerful and careful reading and study of the Word of God devotionally for yourself. Just read the scriptures. When we pray, we talk to Him. When we read His Word, He talks back. Nothing replaces the reading of the Word of God for ourselves. That's the whole grain. 
Crushed grain has its value. But it should never replace the whole grain. If people were eating the whole grain, they wouldn't need somebody like me to tell them why the prayer of Jabez is a lot of rubbish or why the purpose-driven lie is a, a lot of nonsense. They'd know that for themselves. They'd be able to discern that for themselves. They're reading that junk. Again, in our first session, we looked at Amos. <coughs> Simon, for the hearing of the Word of God. As we always say, if people are hungry enough, they'll eat anything. There's the whole grain and the crushed grain. This morning, by the grace of Jesus, I've done my best to serve you, brethren, the crushed grain. That's good. But it's not good enough. But yes, by the grace of the Lord, I am privileged to serve his people crushed grain. The whole grain, however, is something you will have to eat for yourself. God bless. <laughs>